Rose. No, I'm not hearing you. That doesn't mean. Hi, good morning. Oh, well, good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Oh, very good. Very good. Have you bought McGill Chris's new book yet? Apparently, it's a real monster. Oh, really? No, I didn't even see that there was one. Oh, yeah. No, he's done a bunch of interviews on um, his new book. It's called The Matter With Things. He wanted to call it Things Aren't Real, but he didn't think that people would like that. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard of it? Uh, I have not. No, I'm waiting for the audio book version. I, I okay. couldn't read that much. My eyesight's crap, so reading that. I so. mean, audio is so much easier, but yeah. I, I actually have his um, his other one on audio and... And paper. Yeah, like sometimes for the references and stuff, paper is just so much easier. Yeah. And then there are particular pieces that I'm like, I feel like, I don't know if I've ever shown you my copy of that book, but I have like... <laughs> and he claims he researched 25,000 papers to write this book and it took him 10 years and it comes in two volumes and two of the it. chapters of the book may be published separately as books I mean I believe it when you look at what he did um with the master and his emissary I mean the mm. level of of information in that book like I've I've read that book like 10 times is no exaggeration. I'm not sure. I've read books <laughs> more than that. Like yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I know I totally get it. So I am not quite ready for that epic. I'm actually trying to finish Kant, which is <laughs> a real mind bender, but uh, it's very, very interesting. I'm up to um I don't know if you've even tried to read it. But, no, uh, I've never tried the uh, the originals. I, I was really enjoying um, like the Stanford, like it just makes it so much easier, right? To at least right. sort of get a handle on the material. And then I think if you, like after doing that, maybe then you have a better sense of how to go about reading it, but. Yeah, I did that and then I tried to read it and it's just. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas with the reading for this week, I actually went the other way. Um, okay. I started with the Stanford and then I was like, oh, this sounds like it's very well aligned with the way I do think. So I wanted to read the book. Um, and so I'm like, I'm not even halfway through the book yet. Oh, okay. But you've had a good chew at it. Oh, yeah, yeah, that. exactly. And I feel like I really like, it's like, yeah, that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly the way I think about it too. Yeah, no, there's some really interesting. Uh, are you there, Robert? Sorry, we're not seeing you. I assume you're online. No? Oh, okay. Oh, here he is. Oh, there he is. Hello. 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 You're in a hotel room? Oh, no, you're. Oh. <laughs> in, <laughs> yes. Is my crappy air conditioner? No, I'm in Portugal. Um, nice. I was, yeah, I'm reading. So we're reading Kuhn? Yeah. Yeah. Have you read Kuhn at all? Or? Yeah. But you know what's funny? I don't remember. <laughs> like I remember reading it, but I don't remember the takeaways. It was some scientific revolutions and kind of how something about like how the old fogies kind of block progress because their reputations are kind of invested in it. And like maybe young people need to like um, go on more edgier places because they don't have any reputations kind of staked on the existing ideas. It was I, I can't remember if it's something that people just kind of say or if it was. Oh, there's a little right. bit more to it than that. The, yeah. par the whole paradigm thing, right? Like he introduced paradigm. the idea of that there's a paradigm, right? And that then you, like instrumentation, everything basically comes back to the paradigm. So you stop trying to answer, like it's all about like, well, what's the puzzle of this paradigm? How do we measure this with this paradigm and building instrumentation, et cetera, around that? And we, like, I, I just, I think it's interesting because it's kind of the point at which we lose sight of, what's reality as opposed to what are the things that we can solve we've now changed the nature of the problem yes yes we go for the infinite game which is much too hard to a nice <laughs> little finite game where we can win right <laughs> and then well, it gets interesting but yeah, yeah it gets but, interesting where he's kind of saying the benefits of that right and then you kind of hit a point and, and this is where i think we we kind of run into difficulty he, he sort of sort of talks about in terms of well then you hit a point and there's this stuff that's like oh like <laughs> there's an anomaly here and if you allow yourself to see the anomaly and be exposed to the, the anomaly and really look at that it's like oh that's what generates a new paradigm and causes us to 
move forward and make progress. But if we don't do that, if we stay stuck in the paradigm, which is Robert, I think your point about the old fogies, like a lot of the time it's very hard for people to be like, oh, this is broken. Like this is where this falls down. We need something new here. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess when I say to remember, like now that I'm reading it, I'm like, okay, uh, it's, uh, I guess the idea is so familiar to me now that I have forgotten its origin. Yeah. Okay, so you've integrated into your way of being. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm happy to kind of, it almost feels at this point a bit. So I guess I, I certainly haven't read the nuances here, so I should read this. Um, but uh, I'm clearly, I'm, cl I'm curious what criticisms are. Um, mostly old fogies who have reputations to predict don't like what he's saying, but um, yeah. Here's what uh, it says in the in the in the post. Like Kuhn's, uh, some of his criticism. Uh, 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 okay, now it says. Okay, two areas. First, it has been argued that Kuhn's account of the development of science is not entirely accurate. Secondly, critics have attacked Kuhn's notion of incommensurability, arguing that either it does or does not exist, or if it does exist, it is not a sig significant problem. Despite his criticism, blah, blah, very influential. So what is, what's uh, incommensurability? In incommensurability. There are three different kinds that are talked about in the article. Uh, it just means that you can't get there from here. That's all. Um, like people think that uh, Einstein is just uh, like um, Newton is a special case of Einstein's theory of relativity, whereas it's not. Okay. Yeah. Um, Newton's, uh, Newton's theory of gravity came about with a certain mindset and a certain way of looking at the world. And after you've adopted Einstein's view, the view which led to uh, uh, Newton's uh, view is incommensurable with um, the views of the modern, uh, well, the, the quote unquote, the later, <laughs> the later period of so Einstein. The incommensurate means that something is so that you can't get there from here. So like this, the sphere is incommensurate with respect to the bazooka. I'm trying to just integrate the new vocabulary here. Um, well, there's three different kinds of incommensurability, which are all actually quite distinct, which I discuss, and I'm, I'm not trying to say that you know, we need to go through them all. I think it's worth mentioning them, actually. I think they're interesting. Yeah, okay. and if this, is, if this is the part of his theories which we'll take issue with, I'm, I'm happy sure. to Okay, let's that. drill into it then. Um, let me bring up the article. Cool. I want to take a minute just to read read this income measure bill six point two really quick. Yeah, go ahead. That's fine. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah, take a moment and have a read. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to share my screen. Share my screen. It's this one. Is it that right? It's probably too, way uh, too small. It. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, so I'll just, um, yeah, so history of science. Yeah, so the incommensurabilities. Right. <clears throat> Have you read Cone before, Rose? No. No. No, no, I had never no. read it before. And so I was sort of surprised because I feel like a lot of the a lot of the material feels very familiar to me, but I had never read any of his stuff before. Yeah, one of the really interesting things I found from it was his claim that two people standing in the same place looking at the same evidence will see different things yeah. based on their history. That that to me is really profound. Yeah. I mean, I think it's also interesting in terms of some of the other stuff that we've been talking about in terms of like our, our categories and structures that we build and then how they influence what it is we see. And I think this is very related to what he's saying with the paradigms. Like, okay, so we start off with some maybe biological um, innate structures that relate to survival, right, that we might believe have been evolved over over generations mm -hmm. and then with experience and education we start to combine these into more complicated structures or 
ways to view the world paradigms right and and sometimes that's great because it helps us to get to things really quickly and solve puzzles within the paradigm but where it falls down is that it's it's given us a very specific way to see things and then often we miss things that that don't fit in the paradigm right, right. We, 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 end we, up we are literally them. blind to them right, we, right. We, literally we blind. cannot see them like we, we, we cannot <laughs> right it's just not there no. and so there is huge information loss there and then he talks about even at one point he talks about like the causality piece of it that you know he talks about it in terms of x-rays and stuff that like there were there were these things that were playing a very significant role and all the previous signs that we did completely ignored these things and then moving forward we start to put you know controls in place for these things but we don't go back and sort of think like oh but that broke all this right. other knowledge we have if we too were to much, consider yeah. that too yeah yeah <clears throat> so they talk about it that they don't talk about that in the book they talk about it in the article they actually gave that exact thing a name called oh. coon loss yeah okay so coon loss means that um okay we've all shifted to this new point of view but now we can't explain what happened before right yeah so things that we used to be able to explain are no longer explainable so i think that's really interesting in terms of some of the stuff that we've been talking about in terms of causality and um you know, latent variables and all of that sort of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. our structural causal models when there's something outside of it that's clearly having an influence and we're working in, in, a, in a situation that it's not randomized. So we can't just ignore that thing. What do we do about that then? Mm -hmm. I went somewhere a little bit different with it. Um, I, I kind of was riffing on this idea of two people standing in the same place, seeing the same thing at the same time, seeing different things mm -hmm. in the medical thing, saying, oh. okay, I have two patients who seem to be in the same place at the same time, therefore this treatment should have the same effect. I, I mean, I think this is like... <laughs> no. Well, it should, right? <laughs> like if you show the same patient to a different specialty, Right. right. They'll come up with a completely different diagnosis. Exactly. This is okay. I am a I'm a surgeon. This is what right. this is what this is. This is what I can do. It really has to do more with our own structures and tools than it has to do with actually the um, even with the same evidence. Like they're not ignoring the evidence. They they are seeing the evidence. It's right, right. in front of them. But they just literally see it differently. I find that really. Well, I think the, the pieces, it, the, it's interesting, like the, the, the pieces that we fill in, right? So, so there are things that you just can't see, right? Because right. the structures don't support them in the first place. Right. And then we, we sort of pick a few data points and then we start to fill in the rest. Oh, this kind of looks like- Oh, this. it generates some explanations, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. And I mean, that's exactly what we do with machine learning, right? Like we'll take these few data points that we do have and then just try and Okay, that's that's my model, <laughs> and so here's the answer I'm going to give based upon that model. I have a plausible explanation, therefore I'm right. Right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'm curious, Robert. What stage do you think that uh, machine learning is it? Is it pre-paradigm? I mean, is it? Do we have enough clarity around machine learning to to say that? this is how it's going to be? Or is it still, are there still wildly different factions explaining or not explaining what we're seeing in very, very different ways? I'm, I'm not that broad in the literature, but uh, what's your opinion on that? Do you think that you know, machine I, learning is kind of uh, landed? I mean, I think that, um, so I mean, I think so. If we focus on mis like machine the machine learning research community, um, I think there's um, maybe a broad acceptance of um, like say what the limitations of current methods are, and I think there's widely differing opinions about how to solve them, and um, I think that you know, if there's a paradigm at all, it's the uh, the paradigm not, that's not only set by you know the uh, 
you know, well, may say like the, I, I consider like kind of neural networks, deep learning to be a, insofar as it's articulated by um, Jan LeCun, Yashua Benzio, mm -hmm. um, Jeffrey Hinton as the, uh, like, as the current paradigm. And I think that, um, you know, say for example, Yasha Bengio's uh, forays into causal reasoning have have almost single handedly legitimate. I mean, that's a strong statement, but in, in my view, from where I stand, it feels as like this person's um, accept, you know, like uh, acknowledge, uh, kind of jumping into this field to as a place to explore problems is almost single handedly legitimized it as a as a as a as a uh, kind of problem that needs solving. And I think like, you know, part of the issue with causal inference in my experience and, and also with probabilistic methods is like, um, uh, it's hard, it's benchmarks machine learning. So I'm looking at what it says here about um, uh, uh, incommensurability, uh, methodological incommensurability. Um, my experience in machine learning is that problem spaces don't get in, don't get explored if there is no validation data set um, that you can use to explore the problem. And this, this, you know, so for example, I'll tell you, I'll give you two examples of one things that I'm currently looking at. Uh, there is a technique called inference uh, planning as inference. So, like, say you know you're trying to uh, take, uh, you have some action, you have some reward, and most things will try and kind of predict the reward given the action and then choose the action that optimizes the reward. Um, but the way that humans kind of reason is that uh, they kind of uh, mentally simulate different things that they do and that lead in, and, and, and the actions that they result in, and then put more weight on outcomes that have higher reward. And so like, rather than looking at the, the at actions the, uh, given, uh, sorry, reward given actions, they're looking at uh, actions given high rewards. Um, and so like that's called planning as inference because you kind of, the, the mind kind of turns it into like which actions would lead to this higher reward as opposed to um, let's optimize this action, this reward function. And um, now, from the current benchmarks in reinforcement learning, there, there is no real justification of using planning and, as inference because the results will be the same according to those benchmarks. And you'll probably use more compute or, or you have to use you know, a bunch of heuristics to, um, to, to reduce the compute so you're being more approximate than you might like to be. Um, but the problem is that this is actually how humans think. While, while um, humans do not, you know, opt, you know, do gradient descent in their, in, in, like at least at a system two level, they're not like, um, they're not calculating gradients and then moving in the direction of the, of the lowest gradient. And so, mm -hmm. like, um, the same. So, uh, counterfactual reasoning is the same. Like, um, I want to write an algorithm that says, okay, I, I don't know, saw this ad and um, clicked on the app and, cl and clicked on the link, would I have clicked on the link had I not seen the ad? Or I, I saw this ad and I bought an object, would I have bought the ad had I not seen the ad? Like people don't, like I'm writing a paper on that, but like it's, it's hard to come up with the, um, the, the validation because you simply can't, I can't, uh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a multi-world counterfactual. I can't validate what happens um, in general um, from a, you know, a parallel universe. Um, but for that very reason, you know, the paper will be hard to get past reviewers because they don't see that there's acceptable validation. Of right. the but that's definitely 100% how humans reason about cause and effect and how humans make decisions. Like, all right, if I do this, I'll regret it. That's how we think. <laughs> like, or I did this thing and I regret it. That's a counterfactual thought. Like there is a parallel universe where I, I made a different decision and things work out better.
but you have no, you have no, you can't prove that that's true. And yet that, that drives your decision. making. And so like, and so here, here are two kinds of reasoning processes, some algorithms that are approximate human reasoning that are very much um, like, this is how the most intelligent engines of the, the intelli most intelligent um, machines that we know of the human brains work and we don't explore that space because there's no way of validating the uh, the algorithm there's no training there's no uh, validation so there's no eminence and that Robert, bothers me when you're talking about this right now i'm thinking like there's something with machine learning where even though we talk about agents and stuff from our perspective there isn't really this idea of agency of i am going to do these things and I'm going to affect the system in this way. And then I'm going to double check that what I thought was going to happen actually happened. And then I'll make my next step. It seems like in most of the things we've discussed, there's this sort of flat, like there's a policy there, right? And we make a decision and then we might update the decisions at some point in time, but there isn't the same feedback loop of testing that the, the expected outcome actually happened. Right, I think we do that. We don't just make, like you don't just make a decision and put it there and then never come back to it again. I think we do though. Like what, right. the kind of practical stuff, like I, um, like there's things that you, you made decisions in the past and they led to your, um, um, they led to some current, your, your current life, the current mm -hmm. state of your, of your world and and you, there's no way for you to say like, okay, is this world that I live in, is, is, the, is the outcome of this decision better than what would have happened had I made the other decision? Like, I mean, you might, you might conclude yes or no to that question, but you're not gonna do so by comparing to the universe where you made a different decision. No, but you, I think you'll compare something, right? You'll like, am I happy in this job? Am I happy in this marriage? Am I happy with where I'm living? Can I imagine something that's different? Is this, did this work out the way I thought it was going to work out? Yeah. Or is there something about this that's like, oh, this is not at all what I imagined? Yeah, I think that happens. Like if I say like, I'm going to, I don't know, work at this company and because it's going to give me all of these great benefits and then you'll go work for the company and it doesn't give you the great benefits. Mm -hmm. I think then um there we learn a lot so, so then you're looking at something in the environment and trying to trying to make some assessment and then take an action upon that right you're taking an action upon the changed world whereas i feel like a lot of the policy stuff we've made a a generic set of rules and we apply that over and over again and maybe at some point there's sort of an automated well let's update the policy now but it's not a, okay, I've taken this, this set of actions, I expected these outcomes. I'm gonna take a look at some way to assess, did the outcomes happen? Do I need to do something different? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there is, I mean, we have, there's an algorithm. So like, so if, if your prediction in the observed world doesn't, equ doesn't evolve, doesn't equate to what actually happens in the evolved, in the, in the observed world, then there's like a, then you know you as a person well depending on how introspective you are how how, how likely or whatever your kind of retrospective bias is um you might say like okay well i need a better so here you know like i like using rom romance examples because they're the most poignant but to say like you know there's that friend who keeps keeps dating the same ver version of a, of a person in this miserable major relationship and they don't they refuse to learn um, and then there's other people who are like, oh, wow, like, um, you know, I'm never going to date somebody whose parents treat me like crap again. Um, and, and so it's so you learn from that policy. And I think that's kind of, you know, online learning just is that in, in machine learning. Um, I think uh, learning in a way where you're predicting what happens in other worlds where you make other decisions and trying to avoid and then try, you know, try to enhance that. So there's something, there's something called online counterfactual policy learning. Um, and 
yeah, and so what you do is, you know, or, uh, or online counterfactual regret minimization, I'd say. And so what you're trying to do is like, um, you know, it's like Jeff Bezos gives that advice, um, uh, like do, you know, like minimize regret, like make decisions in life that are gonna minimize mm -hmm. your regrets. And, and I, think, I think that's an algorithm that I think, uh, I think that people do, and I think that algorithm, and, and that people have made those algorithms, although I've never implemented them. So you try and project out, here are what I view as five options or something, and you try to project out what each of those are going to be. And that's- Yeah. And, a... and I think what happens is, most of the papers I see, they're, you know, so what, sounds like what you're talking about is like kind of we need both right online learning and online regret minimization um in a sense that like so online counterfactual regret minimization often comes up in games so like if i'm trying to train an algorithm that's going to win a board game right um then you're going to start having the algorithm simulate the outcomes of its different decisions and then choose a decision that minimizes regret and if the and if the opponent is doing the same thing you get some kind of nash equilibrium um but that assumes that the rules of the rules of the game are like are such that you know you know enough about the ground truth. You don't you might not know everything. You don't might not know the full game state, but at least the uh, the physics, the rules of the game are known such that your simulations are. You, know, don't, you might have uncertainty from not knowing certain facts about the game state, but you're still you know the rules of the game. Um, while in real life we're kind of learning the rules as we go. So that's the online learning component. And the rules are always changing. Welcome, Rob. Sorry, uh, I missed your mo a message. I put my ears for this. So. Um, uh, so I'll just comment on this very briefly. Uh, so <clears throat> the thing that I find missing in the literature, which is come through from from Kant very clearly is the idea of a bounded possibility space. All right, that basically a priori, we know what the limits are of the search space that we're going into. And this is lost, all, all lost over all the time. So um, if we have a parameter that goes from zero to one, then that's the only range it can have. And so we can essentially bound the space um, uh, using just parametric boundary conditions, which will give us a very large space, but uh, it's smaller than infinity. Um, but this is where we get into what Kant calls um, transcendental logic, which is we can further reduce the, the space of possibility by knowing a priori relations between parameters, right? So. If, if I have three X and X as separate parameters, I can collapse them into one because a priori, I know that you know, there is a, a, a fixed relationship between them. And so there doesn't seem to be any effort, maybe I'm missing it, but there doesn't seem to be any effort to try and minimize the search space before you even begin, if you, if, if, as it were. So that, that's something that, that, like when you play a game of chess, um, we, we, we roll out these possible futures, right? So we have these kind of, um, this gets back to category theory and, and functional programming, but we have this kind of uh, infinitesimal calculus rules. Okay, well, I can, I'm a, a knight, so I can go two forward and one to the left, two forward, one to the end. So I have these very, very incrementalist kind of narrow little, little views of the world, and I can put them together in chains and do these rollouts and, and see where they take me. Right, and so I can search, I can move through the search space, but there's no contemplation of the space itself, right? So that's missing to me. Maybe it is out there and I'm, I'm just uh, not, not seeing it. But when we set up these games for these, these agents to play, we, we try to create games where these interrelationship between the rules essentially aren't there or aren't, aren't relevant. And I think in our world, in the real world, uh, what what uh, Robin's trying to get? Oh, sorry, Rose is trying to get is um, is that that's not the case, right? We we do need to kind of use what we know to try and uh, bound the search space of, of, of what's possible or at least plausible from where we are, 
to see where we can go to. But no, we always seem to go back to this incrementalist mode. Well, I can get there from here and I can, you know, I can walk around this, I can do this drunken walk through space, but uh, sure, that'll work. But if it's a, an N dimensional space where N is a very large number, what do you, you know, you're basically just groping around in, in the dark. And, and if you find something good, then you've been very lucky. Uh, I don't know how you can call that science. But, uh, I'm sorry, I'm so late to this conversation, but isn't that exactly what alpha zero does? Alpha zero, yes. So alpha zero does that. It, it is, but it doesn't do it causally, does it? It, it just rolls out different possible futures based on uh, this kind of localized view, right? That's my understanding. What Alpha Zero does is it kind of uh, distills, I like to say it distills strategy into tactics. So over time, it, it does roll all these rollouts and, uh, and figures out what works in, in, in a longer horizon and then compresses that back into its one step predictions. So that, it, it, so that even its one step predictions are taking into account deep the, the results of deep strategies. And so the way Alpha Zero works is you can, you can, I mean, it's designed for these board games, but it's, it's useful to think about anything in any context. It, um, you can ask it for its immediate prediction for how good the next move is, mm -hmm. but that's not typically how it's run in production. In production, you would ask it to explore multiple levels Mm -hmm. uh, but each level is not like the like back in the day with like Deep Blue, the chess computer Deep Blue it was the most powerful computer that beat Kasparov. It would brute force chess moves, brute force oh. like brutally, millions and millions of moves, and as deep as it could do. And Alpha Zero distilled that down so it only kind of much more like a, a game expert. It would only explore the promising paths. And that gave it a lot more ability to search a lot uh, in a more meaningful way and to just skip out, out of hand, just skip giant parts of the search space because okay, that's it had I mean. distilled yes. all that out through its right. experience. And it knows, yeah, there's, there's just nothing down there. It would just, it would have a low value for those choices and you can run it in, in immediate mode, which is just take the first prediction on the, what board piece it thinks would be the next best play. What action is the best play? Or you would typically run it in depth mode, which you would give it a chance to look a little bit further than the first step. So I think Alpha Zero is a really useful, um, uh, but I, had, I did a whole uh, presentation on it. I won't bore you with the details, but I think it's a really useful uh, metaphor. Sure, sure. I guess where I'm going is though, uh, I'm not disputing what you're saying, Robin. It's just that in real life, in, in the real world, in our online learning sense, we have to do this. Like we, we, we can't just randomly run possible futures. Well, if I, you know, go and make a cup of coffee and then jump out the window, you know, all this kind of craziness. We don't do that, right? We, we very, very narrowly define the rollouts that we do do, and we do do them. I'm not suggesting that we don't, but there's some, and I think you've, you've, put, you've hit the nail on the head, Robin, is that we do have some kind of priors that allow us to, uh, negate huge amounts of search space. This is how I gained massive performance improvement in my own simulator is, is I was able to try, I spent a lot of time trying to work out what I could know before I even ran the simulation. And so now when I run the simulation, I actually do more compute before I even simulate one second, trying to do, trying to work out everything a priori as much as I can. And then only, and then, and only then do I essentially uh, run the, the 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 infinitesimal calculus, right? The, the the rollouts, the little little steps that lead me through the. the and when you space. do those those priors, are they just, are they like deterministic priors, or are they heuristic things? There are things like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that X, or are you like 100% the way things are are baked in my simulator? X is always has to be true, therefore I can bake that in, or is it or is it a rule of thumbs that you're baking in? Uh, they are true a priori, right? So there is one shortest path from where I'm sitting to the elevator. There's only one, right? So if I if I know ahead of time that I'll be using that path many times, then I can pre-calculate that once, or I can find it once, and then I know it forever, and I don't have to come back. I can just look it up. So essentially what we need to do is the first step, and this is going straight back to um, 
category theory again, is you try and see how much you can do as a, as a pure function, as an a priori uh, inference. Okay, so you, you try and do the absolute maximum amount of a priori inferencing before you ever even attempt to roll out. Um, and that's, that's where I'm heading in my work is I'm trying to work out how I can better express these a priori constructions uh, before I even do the rollouts because the rollouts are just insane. Like it can run them forever. And um, the, in a higher dimensional space, there's just so much space to look through that the rollouts themselves are, you know, dots, dots, blindfolded dot drawing basically. Um, so, and the role of data for me is very interesting. So the other thing I would say about what Robert was suggesting is, and maybe you can clarify for, for this for me, I can't think of any other way that we do prediction other than through um, uh, data generation processes, right? So if, if we're trying to make a prediction, we have a model and we try and use our existing model to recreate what we're seeing. And that's, that's, how, well, that's what's going on. We're not kind of just seeing the data and doing some other magical process to, to make our next prediction work. What is this other magical process that isn't data generation? Could you, could you rephrase the question? So I completely buy the, the causal idea that the way that we think about the world is that we, uh, when we see a phenomena, we don't remember it as such, we reconstruct the phenomena. So in our head, we have a, a generative model of the world that can produce the phenomena that, that can produce all sorts of phenomena. And we try and run a simulation in our head that produces the phenomena in that which we see. We create an explanation, if you will, right? So we, right. we, we see something and it's a stimulus, but we can't make sense of it or understand it unless we can come up with a generative model to produce it, an explanation, if you will, even if it's a system one explanation, right? We, yeah. we need to regenerate it. What's the alternative? I'm, I'm just, maybe I've, I've moved to a position on the causal side where I've just gone too far down one, one of the tracks, but how else can you learn? You just basically in the past, I saw it do this, therefore it'll do that again, therefore, is, is, is that how it works? Yeah, yeah, just um, yeah. learning statistical relationships. Yeah, pattern matching. Pattern matching. But how does pattern matching? Correlation, do... right? As opposed yeah. to worrying about the causation, just focusing on correlation, which I would say is the more primal way of learning. Associative learning. But that's all based on experience, right? There's no a priori there. It's just I've seen this before, therefore I'll see it again. Well, that could be baked into our genes. And the a priori is is the the data element that you're looking at right right even the thing itself that's a priori mm. the structure whatever that is, that entity is are these two views conflicting or are they two aspects of the same thing i don't know um i see them as very different but maybe i'm once again missing something very basic here so, um, so does alpha does does alpha zero learn from association, or is it purely generative, Rob? Like it, it generates counterfactuals and then it, it it compares them and then it picks one based on its past experience, right? It's it's not doing statistical averaging or pattern matching or anything like that. Is that true? It's playing it against itself in the mirror essentially, and and then it's treating all these, I mean, you can say they're imagined rollers. They're not really imagined rollers. They're, it's actually playing itself in the mirror for millions of years. And it's okay, playing so, both sides of the mirror. So it doesn't explore more than one. It just makes a move, any move, and then plays the next move. It doesn't contemplate 100 different moves and picks the oh, next one. No, this is what I was saying about it, two modes. In the one mode, it would just immediately pick the best, the mode that it, the move that it rates most highly. Right. But in planning mode, it, it, it will actually recursively call itself a few layers deep and there's a reason for that there's a reason why like so i did a whole talk on this there's a reason why for example atari dqn just picks the best move at at the for the next step it doesn't try to do planning um it doesn't try to ha it doesn't feel the need to look ahead seven steps and wonder what's going to happen then the reason is i believe 
actually, and I, uh, I believe the reason is that a Go board is very chaotic value function. A small change in the board, placing one stone someplace, can dramatically change the structure of the value function and the, and the whole strategy you will need from then on. Whereas in the Atari world, um, it's not a, such a chaotic, steep, jagged value function universe where some small change generally results in a massive change in your strategy. It, it, it is true that if there's like a pixel coming down that's going to shoot you, well, it's important to pay attention to that. But that's very easy to detect. Um, and so, so the value function can be quite smooth. And so you're pretty confident. Oh, yeah, that, that, I'm pretty confident if I move left, things are probably going to work out well. In a go board situation, it's not clear at all. If one stone comes down, everything could change. And therefore, you have to think a few steps ahead because you, have to, because you can't see around a blind corner with any smooth value function. And I'm so sorry, the value... you seem to contradict yourself. You said you have to look ahead because you can't see ahead. That doesn't make sense. So you can't look ahead is I think what you were trying to say. You, so what a value function is in RL is, is uh, basically a summary of the future. Mm -hmm. It's saying um, that, that move to, moving to the left has high value because I think the future is going to work out great if I move to the left. Moving to the right has low value because I'm pretty sure that the future is not going to work out well as well if I move to the right. So the value function is a summary of the future. And what, I'm, what I mean by a smooth value function is that um, when things change a little bit, the value function changes a little bit. But in Go, the value function is not smooth. It's very steep and it's very jagged, it's very chaotic. And so small change on the board, massive change in the value function. And so you can't just look at your value function and trust that you are gonna know how things are gonna turn out if I place a board in the bottom corner. It's no value, uh, neural networks are not powerful enough to create, construct such a value function that will tell you the full future, the value of the full future in one step. The neural networks are just not that good these days. So what they do is they, they, they stack it and they say, okay, okay, based on, the, based on just the value function alone, it looks like placing a stone there is pretty good. Let me explore that. Let, let me pretend to place a stone there and then I will use my, simulator of the opponent which is basically myself in the mirror to see what they would do and then i would i would evaluate my value function again now the new value function has to, can take into account that new stone and so it can account for all the shifts and jagged changes that have happened which you could say if neural networks were better it could have distilled that back into the first step and already known but neural networks are just not that good or you know, well, not that way good in is, very highly chaotic systems. Yes, Go is just too complex of a world for the full value function to be fully summarized correctly in a one move setting. And so they actually do a planning thing. What they do is they do a, a beautiful interlocking of, of uh, system one and system two. They really make their system one distill the system two down. Yeah, not many people understand this, um, hmm. but it's, it's, a, it's, it's pretty cool. Well, it's not a. Uh, it's not going to solve all the problems either. It's. It's. It does a cool thing there, but it's. There's many things it, that doesn't do. So I'm not saying Alpha Zero is an answer to all the problems. But. Mm. Uh, Rob, any comments? No. Yeah. I mean, I was wondering about the Alpha Zero uh, framework too, but uh, Robin described it better than my understanding. Right. So yeah. So this this is very similar to my view too. So I've, I've I've been trying to work on a distinction between system one and system two. And uh, oh, I've got a link here. That's your talk. And it's, yeah, I'll have a listen to that one on my walk today. That sounds great. Thank you. Um. Okay. Uh. Sorry, but let's try and wheel this back to Kuhn and and uh, to uh, paradigms. So you've made a very interesting comparison, Robin, between the, um, the Atari games and Go. And so if we are in a smooth part of the manifold, if we're in a smooth area of prediction space, then we would adopt one paradigm. But if we're in a very chaotic part of the, um, the manifold, uh, the, the, the space, whatever you want to call it, um, the parameter space, if it's very chaotic uh, and 
then we would have to adopt this very different strategy. Would you say that there's a smooth transition between them? So if we can, like, let's say, or do we have to do a paradigm shift, right? So if, 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 should we run different paradigms? Like, should we have competing paradigms? Should we have one paradigm, which is, uh, we don't know how noisy the parameter space is. We don't know how chaotic it is. So we'll run one paradigm that assumes that it's smooth. We'll run another paradigm that assumes that it's rough. And then we'll compare what they're giving us. And that will give us an assessment of the volatility of the parameter space. Or... I think you know, normally when you're going in, you know something about your environment. Like, am I trying to land a, a lunar, you know, or a, some kind of spaceship on a planet I've never been on before that could have like aliens attacking me? That's like one world. Or am I playing in a small world game board where I have like a total understanding of the rules? Like, I think going into a problem, I think so you would have generally to have priority, have basically. going in, right? Some, so we know something about the environment going in, even if we don't know, even if we're going into uh environment we don't not fully know the rules but we might know what is the maximum reward or is the minimum reward we might know the rules in terms of can i restart so those things give us a sense of you might know whether it's a stochastic environment or deterministic i think you i think you generally know going into something some basic things even if you're going like let's say you're going into a medical situation um you know ahead of time oh is this a life or death situation like mm -hmm. is this an icu type situation is this more like, uh, you know, just tweaking my diet situation? Like, well, how bad or good can it be? How much uncertainty is there? How deep is the planning? Like, how, um, so what is the gamma? That, in our own minds, we're making that assessment and we're, we're choosing the appropriate paradigm based on that assessment. Yeah, these days, the paradigm would be, go, I, I would say, you go into your environment, you understand the basic facts of your environment just as an outsider, as a researcher, or as a practitioner, and then you carefully select the, R, the RL algorithm or the whatever algorithm from the library based on your understanding of the problem space and then you apply it and then the learning starts so you're using a lot of human intelligence in select careful selection of the appropriate algorithm based on your general understanding of the parameters of the environment that you're dealing with even not saying that you know the environment inside out but you know the general some general facts about it that lets you select the right paradigm and the right algorithms that match that paradigm because alpha zero will not work in many, many cases. You cannot apply alpha zero to uh, an ICU medical setting. It's just not going to work because you can't plan multiple moves ahead because you don't have a perfect model. Alpha zero's biggest downfall is it needs a perfect model of the environment. And that's easy on a board game and that's impossible in any com complicated medical situation. So, so that they wouldn't be in your library of consideration because the fact is you don't have a model and, and alpha zero only deals with deterministic environments at the moment. Well put. Very good. Oh, excellent. Yeah, very well put. Um, yeah, so, so how, how do you figure out sort of the grid space, if you will? Um, you know, if you imagine a sheet of graph paper, um, you could use a grid on, uh, you know, every fourth line, or you could use a grid based on the individual lines. I mean, yeah. so if you, you, you talk about taking an alpha technology and applying it to other situations um it means it, i don't know if there's a way of automating that process i mean you could you might automate it it might be an interesting research thing but it's probably the least efficient part to automate because if you make a good selection at that point you save your whole self and your system a huge amount of work downstream so I think having like a really wise selection at that point using the best type of intelligence, human intelligence, whatever uh, you need to do, like, you know, send an email to some people. That's part of your algorithm is email all my AI expert friends and, 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 and get their opinion on which algorithm I should you start with. And if that's your step zero in your algorithm, that's probably a really good thing to do. Even if it takes two days to get your responses, that's probably worth it. However, if people are looking at like true AGI, they might want to automate that step and say, okay, I'm, I'm now in some new environment and I don't even know anything about it. And, and then I have to pick for my life. We're not there yet. And I don't think AI is there yet. Uh, Robert Ness, any, any comments on that? May not be there. Okay. Um, so, You've made a fair comment. So we have to somehow 
establish a paradigm before we can do machine learning is essentially what you're saying. Like we have to analyze the situation and go into an existing paradigm. Oh, this is a reinforcement learning problem. Oh, this is a statistical inference problem. Oh, this is a, a causal agent problem. We need to make that assessment and move into that paradigm and turn this into a puzzle in that paradigm so that we can use the existing literature and the existing technologies to solve the problem within the realm of that paradigm. I was getting at the second step. Like once you know the paradigm, then you have to figure out wait, where in the library am I looking for the specific solution to this one? I think the, the, the previous question of even what paradigm you're in, I think everything presuppo presupposes that you already know that before you start. Um, I don't. I haven't, can't think of any situation where you're given a problem and you don't know whether it's an RL problem, a supervised learning problem, an unsupervised learning, where you don't even know those things. I actually can't even think of a setting where you wouldn't know whether it's whether you're dealing with RL or supervised learning. Uh, you could frame things in different ways. I don't know, I'm just I'm just trying to get back to the, the the main topic here, which is we're trying to understand the idea of paradigm shifts. So if we came up with a result that we're happy with, let's say. Uh, we use AlphaGo Zero. Uh, we we have another problem. Okay, so I can look at this problem and say I, I have perfect apperception. I know everything about my internal state, yeah, yeah. Um, and as That's such, me. because yeah. I know about my internal state, this is the perfect match for something like AlphaGo. So I'll I'll just use the paradigm that they use to solve Go using the AlphaGo system, and I'll apply that paradigm to my problem, and it'll give me a good result. Uh, but I have to know all these things beforehand. And that, that's an induction problem, which I don't think we're trying to cover here. But um, what Kuhn's saying is, is that if we get results from one of these paradigms, we may not be able to translate it into another. That's my understanding. Right. So David, you're referring to the, the machine learning tool as the paradigm. And I'm kind of- The grasp, of... if you will how we choose so, to grasp the problem. Sorry. So I think there's the, the view of the world, which is the paradigm, right? right? The piece of reality that you're trying to solve for. And then the machine learning algorithm is really more like a type of instrumentation or something similar, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's some tool that you're going to use to try and do something within this paradigm. Sure. But there is a, what I'm trying to get at is, is that already within machine learning, we have multiple paradigms. We have deep reinforcement learning, we have uh, Q learning, we have supervised learning, we have unsupervised learning, we have causal agents, we have all these different paradigms. Uh, Kuhn talks about this and he basically says that they'll never converge. They'll just continue to essentially speciate into more and more and more subdomains and more and more and more, you know, so there's yeah. no convergence here. There's just, we have this long laundry list of paradigms available to this toolbox of, of screwdrivers and spanners and socket wrenches and electric drills available to us. And uh, so long as we pick the right tool for the job, uh, we can essentially just use it to solve a puzzle and get the answer that we care about and we're done. Right, and so I think that's the problem is that we're trying to be far more we're, we're trying to generalize what machine learning can do far more than it actually can, right? We can define a particular space that we wanna look at and one particular puzzle that we wanna look at. And then we can go out and try different machine learning algorithms or approaches. I guess algorithms isn't even the right word, but different types of machine learning. I think we can, we can probably get convergence between the different machine learning approaches and even between dif different machine learning algorithms in a very small space, right? But what we're trying to do a lot of the time is, is use this to understand the world. And that's where we'll never get convergence because we need to put a box around it, first of all. And mm. we need to select, well, what is the specific paradigm that we're, we're using right now and what is the particular puzzle within that paradigm that we're trying to solve? Sure, sure, very good, very good. I don't think it's particularly useful to try and come up with an algorithm that can pick the right paradigm. I think that's a that's an unsolved area. Uh, and oh, yeah. so, we, Robert? 
Yeah, I guess I'm not sure I agree that, like, it's how you're framing the problem, like, um, so first off, let's remind ourselves that, like, Kuhn is focused on, on uh, talking about scientific paradigms, right? So, like, uh, you know, like, um, I, I'm not sure that's, I think that's a meaningful distinction in the sense that it's easy to, um, forget that machine learning is um, yeah, like if you predict something really well, that's not science. Uh, the question is like the question of how is the best, how, what is the best way to predict things or what does the ability to predict something say about that thing in the real world? Like those kinds of questions are more akin to science. Um, and so it's, I think it's, important to not lose sight of that. I, I also think that uh, things like unsupervised learning versus supervised, you know, and these are, I mean, I think these are different problem or articulations. Um, and so I think like, but I think more, more broader things like what is like say generalized uh, AI or strong AI, like that's um, kind of like an art, you know, uh, that is kind of like, you know, in terms of what is the best way to accomplish it. Um, more along the, more akin to the side of the science question where there are different paradigms in terms of how do we get there. So like another one might be, so strong AI, generalized AI, there's Turing tests or um, various um, uh, kind of long-term milestones for, for, for artificial intelligence, I think. Uh, the paradigms are defined in terms of what, uh, uh, in terms of those questions, in the same way that physics is, is the, the paradigms of physics are defined in terms of what's the objective state of nature, um, or the, what's the most objective description of nature that's true or something. Uh, and so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think. I, you know, I, it, yeah, I'm sorry, I guess, I guess I, yeah, I, I had nothing else to say about that. I mean, well, yeah, but I, I, I think that, uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> I guess I didn't understand what you, what you were saying. Can you try and rephrase? Are you saying that you think that we can have generalized machine learning completely independent from domain? Uh, well, I'm saying that the definition of a paradigm in the context of artificial intelligence is, um, I, I think it needs to start from a science, a scientific question. Um, and so the scientific question is not what, what's the, what's the best predictive algorithm? Uh, the, the scientific question is, will be something like, um, uh, first off we define Generalized, uh, generalized AI or strong AI, uh, and then we, uh, and then we, uh, um, and we ask the question: What is, what is, you know, what is? How do we, how do we engineer that? And then the paradigms are defined in terms of uh, beliefs about the best way to, about how to solve those problems that come down from those broad problem descriptions. So I mean, I, I have trouble. Like machine learning is not a problem. It's a, branches solutions. I guess the real question for me from a scientific perspective is what is the problem that we're trying to solve and then working back to, to, to identify what the, the various paradigms are in terms of solving. So, so I think it's the same thing I was saying earlier. You're talking about the paradigm being related to artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I guess what I'm trying to say is the paradigm really relates to the part of reality that you are trying to apply AI or machine learning to. And machine learning and AI, it's just the instrumentation for how you might go about understanding some piece of that. And so hoping you can generalize machine learning to understand reality, like that's just, it's kind of a non-starter. Right, you have to start with a specific problem, and and then define the parameter or the paradigm that you're viewing that problem with. 
I mean, that's, I guess, generalized AI is that the whole point of that definition of a, of a, of a goal is to say, I, I want an AI that can decide, you know, can predict what traffic's going to be this morning and also, you know, predict what the best, um, you know, whatever other decision that's completely unrelated from another domain. Um, I don't know what the best stock to buy is, for example, and like it should, uh, and, and that's, so generalized AI is, is supposed to be like humans who can make, who can reason about multiple unrelated domains. Um, I'm not, you know, whether or not that's a worthwhile goal or whether or not it's kind of, um, uh, you know, or, or yeah, that's the percent, I mean, to me, that's beside the point, but the fact that people articulate that as a goal and and want to art just have discussions about what's the best way to, to reach it, uh, don't you think that that defines certain paradigms? I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is I think what Kuhn is bringing to the table is that even humans are operating from a paradigm, right? When they're trying to solve a particular thing they're already bringing a whole set of a priori to, to the table. And so thinking that we're gonna have a generalized AI that can generalize every single human being, right? Like it's just, <laughs> they could take every possible interpretation of everything. Hmm. That's a complete non-starter, at least a non-starter right now, right? So the best we can hope to do is to be able to replicate a particular perspective of a particular situation. So you're, well, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. going to oh, oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if kind of following on uh, on Rob's comments, if uh, if we've got a uh, a unified approximation theorem for functions or for distributions. Um, can we have the same thing for paradigms? Yeah, why not? Like in this in the 70s, there's or 70s or 80s, there's this thing called a strips planner. And it was like this AI system that would you'd give it a problem and it would just try different paradigms. And it wouldn't assume that it knew what paradigm would make sense. And it'd be like, uh, let me try logic programming on this for a while. And it would have make a little sandbox and it would try some of that. Am I getting anywhere? I'm not sure. Let me try this other approach for a little while. Maybe I'll try a prediction thing. And it would actually construct these sandboxes and then it would start to rate them and say, that paradigm looks promising in this problem. And uh, so I haven't seen anything like that these days. That's like an old system. Um, but these days it's more like, hey, um, we're gonna make a new algorithm for this particular paradigm. And we, we generally, the paradigm is assumed before you start even talking about the problem. You're solving puzzles within the paradigm. Yes, yes, I agree with you. Yeah, the strip yes. planner was something, something unique, and I, I think that'll be the way AGI goes. So how do you define the problem in that situation, Robin? I guess that's what I'm saying is the problem itself is the paradigm, right? It's You've already defined it in terms of a puzzle that has like, here are the rules, here are the things you're trying to change. Well, like in a, in a sense, reinforcement learning could be the master paradigm because everything could be phrased in a way of, uh, you know, you want you want to win at something. You phrase everything as a game. Like I'm going to predict, you know, what someone's shoe size is by their height, and I turn that into a game, and I, I turn and I consider it. It's actually a prediction problem, but you can frame it as RL. You can frame pretty much anything as RL if you want. Um, so, there, so there's there's some ways to kind of put shoehorn everything into into some box if you want if you need to do that, and that's actually not a crazy thing to do in a way, but it is a crazy, th but it would be a crazy thing to to say presuppose which algorithm you're going to use, and that's what I was trying to get at with this um, when I said this slide is a single paradigm but many regimes, is when you get down to it, there are different paradigms, and that's fine, but even with on, within one paradigm the cardinality of things in a practical sense, the cardinality of things really determines what regime you're in. For example, if you're in a problem setting where you can't even count the number of actions you can take, that's a very different regime than playing uh, rock, paper, scissors where the number of actions you can take is only three. It's, it's 
it's of a completely different type. It's like, it could be the same paradigm. You're doing uh, RL or you're doing supervised learning, whatever. In that sense, the paradigm could be similar, but the cardinality destroys any much of the commonality between those because the same algorithms are not going to work because at the end of the day, the, the amount of data you have is, is a completely different type. The cardinality makes certain things completely impractical. Um, so I don't think it's just a matter of paradigm. I think the, the, the cardinality is you have to really think about the cardinality to make any sense of, of what's feasible. So I think those two things have to go hand in hand. And that's why, um, like, you know, the Go board has so many more positions than you can move your Atari joystick. Like, that's a, actually a big part of the why Go is so hard, because the cardinality is so huge. Uh, we're a little bit over time, but it's a very, very interesting discussion. Do we want to carry, I think it's very fertile ground, do we want to kind of carry this forward? I'll look for some uh, contrasting uh, kind of material and I'll post it. I'm not trying to bring this to a close, I'm just trying to, while you're all still here. Yeah. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll dig a little bit uh, deeper into this next time. One of the things I'd like to explore with you is the idea of mining DNA to find out the results of the four billion year old uh, reinforcement learning experiment that uh, the universe has been running on us uh, up until the current era. Is there information embedded in our DNA or in, uh, can we essentially mine our DNA for patterns uh, of uh, paradigms or whatever you want to call it? Is there information that we can draw from this genetic algorithm uh, that might we could exact into like synthetic models that we run on computers? That's the question I have. Uh, I don't think we have to tackle that now, but one of the things I've been uh, thinking about a lot lately is this a priori, the concept of a priori knowledge. Uh, that's why I've been reading so much of uh, Kant. And to me, um, there is a huge amount of knowledge uh, embedded in our DNA because we, we've been running this program for so long and yet we don't, once again, we don't seem to pay any attention to it. We, we don't look for, we want to be the discoverer of the thing. We don't want to just go and find it that, 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 that was worked out four and a half billion years ago or something. So we're not even looking uh, at a very rich source of, uh, of knowledge. Uh, and I don't even know if we know how to approach uh, attacking that. That's kind of, kind of where I'm coming from in my work, is that I'm very interested in trying to understand how much we can gain from a priori knowledge before we even start doing rollouts. And uh, that's proven to be very rich, very interesting area. So is that a non sequitur? Probably. But, uh, uh, it's a good, good idea to ponder. <laughs> I got uh, the middle, but yeah, we can talk more about it next time. Okay, so I'll. I'll uh, it looks like this is a great, great thread, so I'll try and uh, try and find some more material. Robin, you'll finish reading the book. Uh, sorry, Rose, you'll finish yeah, reading the book. I will. I'm, I'm going to get the McGill Chris too. Yeah, it's not a long well, book. What's that? It's not terribly long. It's not a terribly long book. No, no, and it's actually uh, the audio book's quite good. Yeah, McGill Chris has just put out his new epic. I'm going to go. Like, I really have to go. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye. All right, let's call it there, folks. We'll see you next time. Okay. Right, Thanks, everybody. Bye.